Hello YouTube, my name is Zach, and today I'm going to be talking about the ever-requested, highly controversial singing figure we all know and love, Mr. Kevin James Abree. Let me move my mouse out of the way so you can see his eyes piercing into your soul. No, I'm kidding. So, first off, before we get into this, I have to just say I am overwhelmed and humbled and incredibly happy for the support that you guys have given me. I'm at 100 subscribers and I have no idea what to even think about it. I, I certainly haven't um, gone into this anticipating growing as quickly as I have. I thought that maybe a few people would look at some of my comments on a few things and, no, this is cool, not my thing, but I've just been overwhelmed with so much support from people and so many requests and so many people showing that they're truly interested interested in this. People have come to me wanting voice lessons. I mean, this has just become an incredible thing for me. So I couldn't do it without you who's sitting there looking at your screen listening to me right now. So whoever you are watching this, thank you. This is... I wouldn't say that this is like a you know dream come true to have people listen to me because it's something that I never even fathomed that the masses of people would be interested in. But you are because you're watching this. So thank you, and I promise that there will be more good stuff where this comes from. So let's um, let's get started with this whole James Labrie thing. Now, before we go into this, before we go into any of this, I want to preface it by saying, first off, this video could be a little bit long, uh, not because I'm going to be wordy anymore, so I'm going to try to edit this a little bit more than I have so that it's not quite as long, but... I want to address a pretty wide range of topics and I also want to address some specific questions that people have been giving me about James since this whole thing started. Um, along with saying this is going to be a longer video, I also want to say that it doesn't matter what your opinion of James Labrie is now. It doesn't matter what your opinion of him has ever been. It doesn't matter if you like the way he sounds now better than you like the way he sounded in 1992. It doesn't matter. That's not the point of this video. The purpose of this video is not to bash James Labrie. So if that's what you came to see, I'm sorry to disappoint. and I'm not going to do that. The purpose of this video is to try to take my knowledge of the voice as a professional in the industry and in the field and apply it to us all possibly having a better understanding of what exactly has happened to his voice over time. Why doesn't he sound the way that he used to? Why is his voice raspier now, or some of the questions I've had? Or why did he sound better for a few years and sound bad again? Or what happened with the food poisoning incident? That's a big one that I'm going to tackle. Um, so that's my goal here. My goal here is not to bash James Labrie. My goal here is not to herald him as the greatest progressive rock singer of all time. That's not my goal. My goal is to be objective and as truthful as I can be combined with academic. That's my goal. So if you came here wanting 20, 30 minutes of me like being like, oh, James Labrie sucks. He's the worst. You're not going to get that here. Move along. Sorry. You can dislike if you want. Uh, no, don't. No, please like my video. Don't dislike it. Uh, I'm kidding. Um, I uh, do expect this to be a little bit controversial. And I do expect that some of you will disagree with me. And if you do, I ask of you, humbly ask of you, that you at least consider the idea that ever, all of this is based on perspective. Um, and when I make analyses and I come up with ideas about James and the way that he sings, I'm basing it upon my practical experience and knowledge of the voice and the experiences I've had working with singers who had similar problems or who've dealt with vocal issues and who have careers. So, um, you know, I, I am a little bit hesitant to name drop specifically, but I have worked with specifically singers in progressive metal bands that you guys probably have heard of. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of them. And I'm not going to, you know, drop their name here because they might not want me to, and I'm not going to do that without their permission. Uh, but, and maybe one day, one day I will possibly, we'll see. But 
I've worked with metal singers you guys have heard and you enjoy and help them do little things to refine their technique and refine their approach. So I do have experience in this field as well. So if you disagree with my opinions, please take a moment and consider that I'm not coming at this from a better than you perspective, holier than thou perspective. I'm coming at this from I've done this stuff before and I know how this works and I know remedies and I know solutions and I can acknowledge and define problems as well. So please think about that before you just, you know, up and be like, oh, this guy's an idiot or this guy just thinks he knows his stuff, whatever. Please try to take that into account. So let's go back to James. James Labrie is incredibly talented. Full stop. No matter, no matter how you look at it, James is incredibly talented. He performs music that is immeasurably difficult to perform. And I don't just mean the, the range of his pitches. I mean remembering all the time signatures, the melodic lines that sometimes aren't strictly diatonic. I mean the length of the song and just memorizing all the words. James is talented. The guy is at his peak form, at his best form, absolutely fit the vision of what Dream Theater was trying to accomplish. He had a virtuosic voice in the time that he joined the band. Now, as I've said before in prior videos, being a great singer doesn't mean that you have great technique. He, had, he was a great singer. He had an incredible voice. A huge range, lots of power, energy. Great performer, great frontman. He was awesome. He had technical issues from the beginning, though. He's always had technical issues. So, um, these are a couple of things I'm going to address. I think, here's my thesis. My thesis is that a combination of James's age, habits that he's had since a young, he's a young singer, misuse of his voice during times, pivotal moments in his singing career, and a touring schedule that is brutal and bad for any singer in any genre collectively have led to his voice not being as strong at this point in his life and his age and his career as it might typically be for someone who approached things differently. That's my thesis statement here and I'm going to kind of go through this piece by piece. Another thing that I plan to do is address some of these questions like I said. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go through this thesis and explain it, and then I'm going to go into some questions you guys asked. So first off, James is 54, almost 55. That, for a singer, is getting old. Placido Domingo, one of the most famous classical tenors, is in his 70s. He's showing decline now. He's had to really lower the range of a lot of things that he's performed just to keep them more consistent. He's not singing in the capacity that he used to, but now his voice is kind of run down a little, but in his 60s he was still singing pretty well. Pavarotti, I, I don't remember exactly what age he died. I want to say 68, something like that. Uh, you guys on, you know, can Google that and prove me wrong if you want, but actually I'm going to prove myself wrong. Let me look it up because it's driving me nuts. Seventy-one, so I was close. Not quite. Seventy-one. Either way, he was singing in wonderful vocal form uh, up into his sixties for sure, because he took care of his voice. And I've discussed him in a prior video, so it stands to reason that James should not have be, in, been experiencing this drastic of a vocal decline in his fifties. So, however, there is scientific physical evidence that shows that a decline in your 50s with, with your vocal singing and vocal approach and whatnot isn't out of the question. So how and why? First off, to be able to explain this to you, I have to kind of give you a little bit of an idea of the anatomy of the voice. Now, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a speech therapist. I'm a voice coach. Very different things. Um, so I don't know all of the intricate um, interactions with the uh, I think it's called like the cricothyroid, crico cricothyroid, like all that kind of stuff. Like I know, I know a little bit of the thyroid, which I'm going to go into. 
um, like the vocalis muscle. I mean, I know about the cartilage of the larynx. I know, I know how those things operate. I know how the laryngeal tilt works, that kind of stuff. But I don't know all the intricate interactions between the muscle tissues and the, the, the stretching and all that kind of stuff. I don't know all that that much. It's not a field of study that I had to delve very, very deeply into when I went through college. So, um, but I do know the basic functions of it, and I can explain that to you in relationship to James Labrie. So, the larynx, which is one of the predominant parts of the body that engages phonation and making sound, is made of cartilage. Cartilage is the same material that your nose is made of, that your bones are made of, your ears, which, you know, not that <laughs> is made of. Uh, that's all cartilage. Cartilage is um, a structure that becomes harder as you age. Babies have soft spots on their heads because the cartilage hasn't quite turned to bone yet, but as it hardens and it turns to bone, it becomes strong. Well, other forms of cartilage in your body don't necessarily strengthen to the same way that bone does. The larynx never quite gets as hard as bone. It's, oh, I'd say, estimate probably about 75 to 80% of the strength of bone, but not quite to the strength of bone. Um, cartilage, however, becomes brittle as it gets older. It weakens. Just like you can fall and break your hip when you're in your 80s a lot more easily than you can when you're in your 30s. It's because the bones are weaker. The cartilage in your larynx becomes weaker. It changes the way that your voice functions. It changes the way that your voice can stably maintain pitches. So as the cartilage brittles, the voice begins to have trouble maintaining, especially for men, pitches in our modal, our chest voice register and it tends to move upward to adjust. Now, the reason behind this is pretty complicated, um, and there are actually muscles involved with this that even scientists aren't completely sure how it works, but we do know that there's a muscle called the vocalis muscle, also known as, kind of more generally, as the thyro, thyro, thyro arytenoid muscle. I got it right that time. That's a tough one. Uh, and what it does is it engages and allows for the stretching and pulling of the mechanism that makes folds the folds vibrate. That gets weaker as you get old, older, like as in any muscle does. So the thyroid thyroarytenoid muscle, let me get it right one of these years, is directly related to the flexibility and the ability for the male voice to move around. So that just happens as a byproduct of age. And it doesn't matter who you are. Now, singing is ultimately a, an exercise in coordination. You're coordinating this tube, so to speak, of things that's happening from here to here, right? And so if you have good coordination, you have healthy coordination that isn't causing your body to do things that are outside the norm or that are uh, unhealthy, then you could probably maintain that for a long time. But unfortunately, James Labrie had some hiccups along the way. So even if he were singing in a healthy technique in his 20s, which he wasn't, uh, it, it, with the things that he, the roadblocks he ran into, you probably still see some issues regardless of things outside of that. So first, again, I want to reiterate that I'm not a doctor, so don't think of this as like medical advice. Uh, let's address the food poisoning incident. And this is a little gross. Sorry, it just has to be due to the nature of the way James described it himself. Uh, he says, I, I don't remember the exact um, verbiage in the interview where he talked about it in depth, but he described himself as vomiting a lot when he when he caught this food poisoning the truth is that vomiting is very unlikely to cause a vocal hemorrhage in and of itself uh, you know if you vomit violently you can make noises like aggressive noises but the bigger problem that comes up from vomiting is that vomit is acidic a lot of it's extremely not always but a lot of it is extremely acidic because it's stomach acids that are you know coming out this way. Gross, right? Sorry. Um, acids are corrosive. So all that acid is passing by all this stuff on the way out. So it leaves 
your muscles, it leaves the vocal folds, all that stuff in a weaker state than before it happened. So by singing a tour, when you are undergoing this kind of vocal duress and this kind of um, intense action that is weakening this entire structure or mechanism, you are asking for damage because everything is weaker. And it's obvious that to sing at the extremes of the voice that James was singing, it requires a lot of control and a lot of strength. And if you're weaker, you're not going to be able to do it as well. So that is the food poisoning incident. Also, let's talk a little about cortisone injections. And I'd have to find the interview. Maybe I can put it in the comments, put it in the description if I can find it. There's an interview where James specifically mentions that in the earlier parts of his career, he'd take cortisone injections to help, I guess, not hurt his voice, which makes no sense. It made it easier for him to sing because the pain wasn't there. So um, what that's indicative of is something called edema, not edema, the crappy like 2000s new metal band, edema. Uh, edema is inflammation. You can get edema, it's, it's as a result of like fluid buildup and you can get it anywhere. You can get edema anywhere that something can become inflamed. And you can get edema on your folds by overuse or misuse. You can also get edema on your folds because you're sick and your sinus your sinus fluids are acting on it. There, there's a lot of different things that can cause edema. But typically when you get a cortisone injection, you're wanting to lower the edema. Edema makes the folds in the area around them puffy and swollen, so it's hard to control things. So if you have edema on your folds, you probably shouldn't be singing. You should be on vocal rest. But James Labrie has openly um, admitted in interviews that on a few occasions, multiple occasions throughout his career, he's taken cortisone injections to enable him to sing when he knew that he shouldn't be. That kind of thing is the sort of decision that can destroy your voice for the long term. To be frank, I think that that's probably worse than the food poisoning stuff because if your voice, if, if, the, if everything is inflamed and you're trying to cause your body to ignore the cause of the inflammation so that you can make it more inflamed, you're asking for problems. Putting a cortisone injection in that in your neck does not mean that the thing that caused the inflammation or the edema in the first place is gone. And if it was caused as a result of a singing, by singing in the same method after having the cortisone injection, you are compounding the problem. So I would argue that his cortisone injections were a major, major contributor to the destruction of his voice or the, the issues that he's had. Vocal misuse as a whole has been sort of the, the hallmark of James Labrie's singing career and his technique. Even if you go back to the 1992 videos where he's singing in Japan, like if you've ever seen the uh, Images of Origin Japan video and you listen to that, the way he delivers his words in those songs with the rasp of that high register is destructive. Putting rasp on your voice is destructive. No matter what someone tells you, and I've reiterated this before and I'm going to reiterate it again, I'm going to make a video specifically about the subject soon, as soon as I can make sure that I've got all my ducks in a row, because I know that one's going to get a lot of, a lot of pushback. So i got to make sure all my ducks in a row before I try to address that issue. I understand my audience. You guys are a lot of you are metal guys, so guys and girls. So you're all you're metal people. Some of you aren't, but the people that are, are in the metal scene hear that rasp and that aggression a lot. So you want to defend it, but the truth is that it's not healthy, no matter how you look at it. And we'll talk about that another time. Um, so vocal misuse, rasp, and that high register stuff. That awake album was extremely aggressive. The songs in that were a very high range. A lot of ah, kind of stuff going on through the whole thing. Um, dangerous stuff. Really dangerous vocal use. Uh, so early 90s, he was misusing his voice when it was healthy by using his healthy, well, using his strong voice in destructive ways. The, if the food poisoning thing happened in the mid 90s, then that probably made his, the it probably compounded the issues he was developing as a result of being, of having a raspy sound in his voice. Um, 
Yeah. How old was he in 1995? If he's 54 in 2018, then that was uh, 23 years ago. So he was 31. It's my age. So um, if you've been singing with a really raspy sound, like a really metalish sound for however long he started singing, I think when he was like 18, 19, if you've been taking that approach for 12 years, that's going to start wearing on your voice anyway, just by default. So compounding it the way that he was, is it only makes it worse. And then the, the food poisoning incident added to the struggles he was probably already having. So if you combine that all together, it makes sense that the late 90s were a pretty low point for him. Um, and I would say that he probably did have some bit of a recovery in the early 2000s, like around the six degrees of inner turbulence era going into Octavarium. However, I hate to break it to you guys, and I'm probably going to get some flack for this too, but score, while it was a great performance on the DVD, his singing was either pitch corrected, auto-tuned, or it was or it was like re-recorded after the fact or something because there are lots of videos on youtube of like audience cameras people taking film from the audience that paint a very different picture of james's singing on that particular performance so you know i understand wanting it to sound professional and, and not wanting to make it sound you know out of place or sounding out of tune for you know a recording that's going to go to the masses i understand that but that performance was not as strong as the dvd might indicate uh, i just wanted to make that as a side note now dream theater also in the 2000s kind of started taking more of an edgier sound again whereas like if you look at an album like scenes from a memory or if you look at even falling into infinity definitely didn't have the exact same rasp, that same edginess on the sound as you look at when you look at something like Train of Thought or Systematic Chaos. It felt like maybe Octavarium wasn't quite as aggressive. But if you look at, you know, the other albums from the 2000s, his voice was much more of like that metal, growly, James Hetfieldish kind of thing. And I think that a lot of that was... Um, put upon him by Mike Portnoy because if you recall that was a time of the band the band was a lot more metal they had a, like the whole like nightmare to remember with the death metal growls by Mike Portnoy and his whole singing approach to delivering that was like much more aggressive and another thing you have to keep in mind that outside of just what you hear on these albums those albums are a result of take after take after take after take after take of doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again until you get it suitable to where it can be put on disc it also each album also represents at least a year of touring nightly doing two and a half hour long shows of this kind of stuff dream theater has been known to not have headliners they just do evening with shows and they're like two and a half three hours long of just them to give you some perspective even operas are spaced out to where like you're never on stage singing a full voice for more than five ten minutes at a time and then you have a break for your part for a while, then you'll come back and sing again. And they're structured that way to preserve the vocal longevity of the singer because your voice isn't supposed to be used that heavily for super long periods of time. So even if Dream Theater plays four instrumentals, which you know, I know they might have they might have four or five, even if they played all their instrumentals and they, they play long songs without a lot of singing in them, um, that would still probably equate to two hours of singing just in a show, or at least an hour and a half of singing in the show, not including his warm-ups, not including if he does any kind of cool-down, which I'm not a huge fan of cool-downs, by the way, but even if you know he didn't have anything like that, it's still way more vocal use than you should have that aggressively. Typically, you shouldn't sing more than 90 minutes a day, period. The voice just isn't built to, for that kind of muscular use for... Uh, more than 90 minutes a day if you want to have a strong voice for you know an uh, uh, extremely long period of time if you want to have a short career you can sing for two hours a day but your your voice will pay for it in the longer and your voice will decline if you take all these factors together the growling sound in the late 2000s that kind of thing like that metal sound the food poisoning incident his raspy approach in the early uh, 1990s um the cortisone injections if you combine all those things together and you look at where James is at right now, yeah, he doesn't sound as good in performance and live concerts as he used to, and they're having to lower the keys and things for you to see them. The fact that he can still put on the show at all is somewhat remarkable. Some people would argue that James uh, should just quit the band and leave. You know, I think that there is 
I mean, I've talked to some people who are pretty close with the band that, or one person in particular who's pretty close with the band who has, has presented to me in the way that he is the definition of their sound and he has a very unique sound. So it's hard to replicate that. Since it's hard to repl- replicate his sound, they, Dream Theater probably doesn't have too much longer before they retire anyway. There's no point in finding some stopgap singer until they just write out the rest of their careers when James has been a staple of their sound. Now, what decisions they'll make in the future, I don't know. My guess is that they are going to lower the range of the songs. They're going to make it to where he doesn't sing as high as he was. Um, They're probably going to make the vocal lines easier in terms of keeping them more diatonic and scalar. Um, The intervals he'll use when he moves from pitch to pitch probably aren't going to be as wide. They're going to be probably smaller to make it easier for him to sing. Uh, and I would imagine their music's going to become more instrumentally focused. Now, it's just a guess. I might be totally wrong. I don't know. But as of today, May 1st, 2018, that's what my guesstimation of what Dream Theater's future would be. So hopefully all of that together gives you sort of an idea of what happened with James Labrie. I think that he takes a lot of flack. I've given him plenty of flack because I feel like if, you know, with Dream Theater's philosophy of being the super technical progressive band that's made waves and changed the, the scope of musicianship for metal musicians and raised the bar, James is not at that standard anymore. He, he's just not. And Dream Theater has been extremely uh, fastidious about hiring top flight musicians for their band. I mean, after Kevin Moore left, they had Derek Sherinian, who was great, but then came Jordan Rudess, who was a step up, and they sent Derek out the door. Mike Portnoy left for other reasons, and I know that's a whole separate debate, but when they when they looked for someone, they went for one of the most technically gifted drummers in the world, Mike Mangini. I think Marco should have gotten the job, but hey, that's just me. I love Mike Mangini. I think he's great, but I, I like Marco's approach. I, I love his drumming in general, but um, so, you know, they've always gone for high skill super high skill players James is not quite that standard and I think that that not anymore he was but not anymore and I think that that speaks to a greater overarching philosophy that I'm going to address in another in a future video but I want to touch on really quick I think that singers get too much leeway for not they don't have the same uh, standard of excellence held to them as musicians like instrumentalists hold to one another Um, and I don't know why that is uh, it's it's just one of those things that sort of become a standard maybe because singers can relate to people not just by the way their voice sounds but the things that they say and so people attach to that or latch on to that I don't really know it, it's something I've thought about for a while but it's true that if you have a guitarist playing out of tune they aren't going to be accepted it, that's like it's, it's unacceptable to play guitar out of tune in a professional performance but singers singing out of tune is far more widely accepted. So I don't know where I'm going to address that in the future, look into that. And I'm going to try to figure out some sort of, you know, consensus as to why that might be. And we'll talk about that when the time comes. And now I'm going to address some questions that have been sent specifically to me about James Labrie. Uh, I know that a lot of you've had a lot of questions about him because this whole channel sort of started because James was the focal point or at least a conversation about was a focal point. So I'm going to be reading from my monitor over here with some different questions that have been asked throughout throughout my channel and been sent to me through email and whatnot. Uh, the first question is, do you think James can fix his voice, like make it stronger and have more range, etc., like in 1994 or so? This question came from G. Garpert. I'm not sure. I'm not to pronounce that. But if you're watching, thanks for the question. Um... And I, I made a response that put simply no, um, and I think that the reason is his age. His voice isn't getting any younger, so at this point he needs to salvage what he's got and try to maintain what he has, as it will inevitably get weaker because of his age and the cartilage will continue to become more brittle. So at this point, no. I don't think there's anything, he's never going to go back to 1994 form. It's pretty much a physical impossibility uh, given the aggressiveness of that tone that he was creating back then anyway so no I don't think it's practically possible Raven Skill Rebel Militia he asked me a few questions uh, one of the things is responding to a comment where uh, he says where I mentioned seeing off the voice that's what he's been doing since 2014 on softer passage he blows a lot of air to sound breathy yes so singing off of the voice is when you sing 
when you sing like this and you have this kind of sound over your singing. When you're pushing more air through the folds, singing and speaking are very similar. So it stands to reason that for the most part, your speaking voice and your singing voice shouldn't sound too terribly different until you get into the extremes of the range, but there still should be a tonal consistency for the most part. So when you start doing stuff like this, without getting into the in-depth detail of it, basically you are manipulating your voice and your folds into taking an action that they don't naturally take. So it's bad by, you know, just for the most part in general, and anyone who does that, not just Labrie. Also, uh, people just don't have the time for music anymore. That line from The Astonishing, The Gift of Music. People just don't have the time for music anymore. So I don't remember, I don't know if it's the right key, but I think it goes something like that. The question that I was asked is, was that auto-tuned or was there pitch correction on it? I've listened to it a few times. I believe that yes, it does have pitch correction on it. If not pitch correction, it is to take splice together poorly. Uh, that's my that's my guess. Uh, I don't uh, I don't know for sure, but from what I hear, it sounds like it is. Yes. Why don't you buy James Avery's story about food poisoning and rupturing his cord from vomiting? I believe something catastrophic happened to his vocals in 1994 because of the big difference between his last show in 94 and first show in 95. But I don't think it's culpable for his long-term decline as a vocalist because he was able to bounce back and sound pretty good at some shows, which leads to my next question. Could you talk about the overall connection between a person's level of physical fitness and their singing? I've noticed Labrie's plunge as a vocalist in 99 coincided with gaining lots of weight. It's not hard to imagine that body fat would constrict the diaphragm or cause respiratory problems. But then there are some overweight singers who are pretty good, like their boy Pavarotti. Um, physical health is important. Eating a good diet is important. Having lots of water in your system is important because that hydrates everything and so much of your body functions based on water anyway. So it's, it's really important to, to keep, that, uh, keep that going and you know, have a good, a good metabolism. But it's not the be all end all. Pavarotti was, you know, he was pretty overweight. He had an incredible voice. Uh, vocal health and hygiene is more important than physical health and hygiene. Utilizing good habits, utilizing, uh, you know, making sure you don't have much tension, utilizing correct, correct placement, good posture, not overblowing by creating subglottal pressure, that kind of thing. Those sort of things are vocal hygiene habits that lead to a longer career, more so than physical health. But of course, if you're in ailing physical health, you probably won't be able to sing very well just because you're not healthy in general. But I digress. Basically, it's more important to have good singing habits than it is to have good physical habits outside of singing. Now, you cater your lifestyle to things that lead to healthy singing is all the better. But it's not the end of the world if you're overweight or something like that. That's that's not a big deal. Uh, you've said that Labrie doesn't actually sing in the passaggio like he, like he says he does. What is he doing to produce the nasal tone that's made him somewhat infamous? Is it pure head voice? No, um, I think that head voice uh, gets a, is a, it gets kind of misconstrued by people sometimes. Putting your sound in your nose is does not mean it's head voice, and you don't put sound in your nose to reach your passaggio. Your pa passaggio is the point of the voice where you transition from register. So if you go from your modal register, your speaking voice, to your head voice, your falsetto, that is me jumping from one to the other. But if I sung my way up and made the change occur through that, that would be me navigating my passaggio. There are several different ways of navigating the passaggio, different for different voice types, and that's way outside the scope of this video. It's already gone really long and I don't want to get into all of it. But James used to navigate his passaggio uh, really well. For example, um, if you, I don't know if, let's see if I can get this to play. <laughs> So that F sharp was from, I think, in the 93 or something like that. And if you listen to it again from the beginning, he starts out in his chest voice and the transition up to the high note almost sounds seamless. It sounds like it's just this fluid motion that moves up. That's because he's using what we call a vocal mix, where you combine the falsetto and the chest voice when you move up through the passaggio. And because he already had sort of a high range, as it was, he moves through his passaggio, keeps that vocal mix, and it sounds clear. He stopped doing that over time, and he's he's belting it a whole lot more up in those high ranges, which is definitely bad for him. I don't know why he didn't maintain what he was doing in this in that particular audio clip, because I think that if he 
I think that if he did, his voice would be a lot healthier across the board because that sounded like a relatively healthy way of singing a line like that. I'm not sure. It's, it's a good question, but he definitely uh, doesn't use his passaggio now like he did then. Now he just belts everything, without a doubt. Maxime Santos says, I'm a big Dream Theater fan since 1998. I love them, and I'm just looking for objective answers about an obvious fact. James' voice is getting worse and worse. <clears throat> Could you explain why James is so often just a little out of pitch? I'm pretty sure he can hear it, but anyway, he never manages to get on pitch, and I always wondered why. Well, I noticed that he sometimes begins his vibrato just below the note and then reaches it, but sometimes he's just a half step below or above. Usually, pitch inconsistency is poor breath support. Um, James has sung those songs enough to where I don't think that he has a misconception of what the notes should sound like. He knows the notes. It's probably something mechanical like poor breath support causing him to be under the pitch. I think I've addressed this in a prior video. Most of the time being flat is a result of poor breath support. 95% of the time. I often have the feeling that he can reach higher notes easier than some ones during songs. Do you see what I mean? Is it technically explainable? Um... I'm not sure. You'd need to give me a specific example. I systematically think he is way better when I'm at a concert than when I hear him on YouTube. Why is that? At a concert, there are frequencies going nuts everywhere. There's very loud speakers playing at all sorts of frequency spectrums. And so your ear has trouble distinguishing the, the minutia of what's happening when you hear so much going on at once. So you probably can't make as clear of a distinction as to whether or not he actually hit that high note or not. Also, they have a lot of effects on the voice uh, at a live concert that lends itself better to a concert hall than it would on like a small f uh, phone camera. So sometimes those phone cameras have like limiters on them uh, that just bring out the treble. And the treble is probably closer to the frequency range that James is going to be mixed into in that whole frequency spectrum of stuff going on at the concert. So he sounds better on and live because your ears can't make those distinctions quite as well. Can you elaborate on the nasal tone of his voice? I think that that nasal sound is um, a way that he's learned to navigate some of the problems that he has. Seeing through your nasal cavity uh, is generally very bad because it makes it hard to have breath support. The nose wasn't built to make sound. And while it is a resonator, it's not a primary speaking resonator. So um, it it's not necessary and it just creates extra tension and it puts the sound in an unnatural place. But I think that it does make you sing higher because of the placement. So when things are more frontal in the face, it's easier to sing higher for the most part. But that doesn't mean that it sounds better. It's just easier to make higher pitches if it's at the front of your face. Kind of like that. Even though it's completely unnatural to the way I would normally talk. Um, so I would say that he's doing that to kind of mitigate some of the struggles that he's having in his middle voice otherwise. According to you, is every hope lost for his voice, even if he decided to be reasonable now? Uh, he can maintain what he's doing right now if they put things in, I think I mentioned this earlier if they put things in a comfortable key I think that he can maintain his voice for another five or six years probably he sounds so good in studio versus live his voice is so bad can we assess that what we hear on albums is 80% fake computer digitized well I hate to break it to you but pretty much everything these days you hear on a recording is fake computer or digitized uh, it's become industry standard to create a production out of an album rather than a performance so uh, it needs to be pristine quality everything needs to be perfectly in tune and every singer has little blips in and out of being in tune even the best singers in the world do so yeah i mean it's definitely manufactured in studio heavily but so is every other singer that you hear there's not a single singer that you can listen to on any kind of commercial recording over the past 10 or 15 years it doesn't have some kind of editing put on their voice and I mean editing goes back even further you know even if you just splice takes together it's still ed edited so that kind of thing happens all the time so yes James LeBrie is no exception so I think that that wraps it up I think I've addressed all the major questions that I've gotten about him and I hope that this video while being long has been informative and helped to clarify some things 
Um, if you enjoyed this, if you made it all the way through, congratulations. I know it was a slog. I know it was a lot of info, but you have a great attention span. And I really thank you for being here and sharing this with me and letting me kind of teach you this stuff and explain it to you. Uh, I do offer voice lessons, as I mentioned in another video. So if you're interested in voice lessons, let me know. Uh, I give them over Skype or Discord, whichever happens to work better. Um, please like, please subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. Um, I'm really looking to make this channel get bigger, and I've got some really cool things that I want to do that I've gone in detail about before. I hope to have a live voice lesson on here pretty soon. Uh, I plan on maybe having a live Q&A. And so if we do that, I would love for you guys to all be there and ask me every question you got. So please stay tuned. Um, and I think that's everything. So if there's anything else you guys want to know, you have any further questions, please feel free to leave a comment and I will, um, I'll respond to it. Uh, I might not make another video about James. I might take some specific questions in a Q&A format or something, but I probably will make another video about James for the foreseeable future. But feel free to leave any questions you have in the comments, and I'll be sure to respond to it and try to explain something to the best of my ability. So again, thank you so much for checking this video out and staying through and hearing me out and just being appreciative of the study and of the academics of this. I know that singing is just a thing that you just listen to, and it's just a part of the music, but it's really cool that you're taking the time to try to understand more about what's actually going on. So I hope you have a great day, great week, whatever it is. Uh, have fun. Keep listening to Dream Theater. James is super talented no matter what people think. You guys have a good one. Thank you so much. Bye.